What I'm going to minister today, this is a complete faith thing, okay? So I want to keep reiterating that. I'm talking the spiritual realm. We're talking the faith issues here, okay? So you got to take, take off your natural hat and put on your spiritual hat, okay? So we, we got our spiritual hat on, right? Amen. When God uses someone, he has to recondition them. He has to re-equip them. He has to change them. He has to completely transform them, hence the term to be born again, as we use, of course, first use that in John chapter 3, initially Nicodemus. So there, there is this regeneration process when you get born again. There is this, uh, continu- this initial and continual conforming to the image of the Son of God, as Paul says in the book of Romans. So the only way God can use someone is that they have to, first and foremost, willingly want to begin to see things, do things, act differently than they previously did. Or else God cannot take them to the level he desires to. So, so God, what, what God first begins to do is he starts reprogramming us. He begins to reprogram, first and foremost, he re- reprograms our spirit. Then, of course, our soul gets reprogrammed. Our mind gets reprogrammed. We looked at that for quite some time, months previously, didn't we? And, 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 and as we're getting reprogrammed, if you will, spiritually speaking, then God, and only then can he begin to show us things, I like to use this term, behind the curtain. How many grew up watching Let's Make a Deal? Now, we all want to you know, we all wanna know what was behind the curtain, Right? And, and were, you, were, were you one of those kind of, of uh, armchair contestants? Is that when they pick the wrong curtain, you're always told them, I told you not to pick that one, you know. But, and then, you know, we, 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 we have the analogy of the Wizard of Oz. Is that when Dorothy finally got behind the curtain, it's like, really, is this all? Now, now that, that's how it is in the, the working of the world. Just like this. If you were to go behind the curtain, I shouldn't even bring this up, but I'm halfway into it, I got to. So anyway, if you were to go behind the curtain of everyone who's on social media, I don't have to say anything else. I'll leave it at that, okay? I, I don't have an issue with that. It's like people do that, you know, whatever. But if you were to go behind the curtain in the natural plane of life, right, you would find that things are not as they do seem Right? Okay? So, you know, like, like online dating. When you go behind, now I have no personal experience with that whatsoever, but so if, it's like online dating. When you, go, when, when, when you go behind the curtain on that stuff eventually. Now, for those of you, you know, hey, if you like Bachelor and Bachelorette and whatever they're called now, it, you, that's fine. That's fine. I see a few people ducking their heads. You just gave yourself up. But anyway, you got to you got to learn to go through life poker face, man. Just but anyway, so anyway, you know, you know, just just eventually, sometimes the bachelor and the bachelorette, you know, they begin to go behind the curtain of the life, and they go, this is not as it initially seemed to appear. Now here's what's wonderful when you serve God. When he takes you behind the curtain, if you thought it was wonderful what you saw in the natural, if you thought it was wonderful with what you have been able to touch, see, feel, experience in a natural plane, when he takes you behind the curtain, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of those who love God what God has prepared for them who love him. Meaning you haven't even, you haven't even started to understand what God has in store for you until you begin to get a look behind the veil, behind the curtain, behind the scene. So how God does this is there again, he has to reprogram us and he wants us not to see what we're seeing. He wants you to see what you currently can't see, but what you have to begin to see every single day. You know, and Paul put it this way, for we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. I mean, they're temporary. 
but the things which are not seen are eternal. And here's the problem with the vast majority of Christians, present company excluded, and those who might be listening around the world, I exclude them. But all the other Christians, they don't see into the eternal. They only see the temporal. I understand why people of this world who are not born again only see the temporal, the temporary. And here's what's interesting, though. Individuals who have excelled in life, who are not even Christians, agnostics, atheists, even God-haters, They've excelled in life. You know one of the main reasons why they've excelled in life? There are many, several reasons. Just narrow this down. One is because they saw what other people couldn't. And look what they did with their life. How much more will God do for his children who can see the eternal instead of just looking at the temporal? When you look at the temporal, when you are looking at the problem, you're looking at the day-to-day life. You're looking at things that didn't work out. So we come into Abraham's life because this, 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 this cataclysmic occurrence just happened. He and Lot parted companies. And there's a lot into that, no pun intended there. There is a lot involved in that. Four or five of you now caught it. There's, there's an enormous amount wrapped into what just occurred. So now we come into this scene a few days later, a few weeks later, but it's still extremely fresh. Abraham is still licking his wounds, if you will. So we jumped, and I purposely jumped right into verse 14. So what Abraham is experiencing, now the Lord comes in and the Lord begins to speak to Abraham. And he says, Abraham, God ever done that? God ever done that to you? When when you're licking your wounds, when you're feeling defeated, when all you see is the temporal, when all you are focused on is what didn't work out and and what didn't happen, what you wanted to happen and things dissolving around you, when you're focused on that, has God ever showed up and said, hey, ever been there? Somebody said, I've been there. Lord said unto Abraham, after that lot was separated from him. Oh, oh, see, there's, there's the issue there. There's that cataclysmic social severance that occurred. So after Lot separates from Abraham, you notice that's the, I need to say it's in the word of God, but that is the correct narrative there. Lot separated from Abraham. Abraham didn't separate from Lot. So you go all the way back, if you would please, go back. We see in verse 5 that Lot also which went with Abraham, he had flocks and herds and tents. The land was not able to bear them both. The land was not able to sustain both of them. Of course, we know that Abraham was extremely rich, and you see that in verse, uh, in verse 2, right? And Abram was very rich. You see that in your Bible? Three people do. They're going to get faith now to be rich also. Let's try that again. Abram was very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. You see that right there? Okay, circle that one in your Bible. The Lord won't strike you down. It's all right. You circle it, highlight it, or memorize it. Put it to memory. You should know that one, right? And there again, I quoted earlier, I quote again from Galatians chapter 3, that that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith. That's one of the many, many, many. I've I've taught on the blessings of Abraham. There, there, there There are 28 blessings of Abraham and actually, you can extrapolate a few more out, but when you categorize them all, you get 28 blessings of Abraham. I don't know about you, but because all of those categories, it, it encompasses everything imaginable in life. That's quite a few blessings. And then there again, they can each be multiplied a few times over. So you're covered. So we are also blessed by faith with our father Abraham, those blessings are to come upon us through faith. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, you got it? Verse 3. Now, so anyway, so we see that Abraham is extremely rich. And, and just for what it's worth, Lot, who was his nephew, I know you know this, but just a little background real quick. Like, Lot was Abraham's nephew. The reason why Abraham was responsible for raising Lot, because Lot was still a very young man. At this time, he's approximately in his, in his uh, uh, t- uh, early, to, early to mid-20s. 
So anyway, because Lot's father, who was Abraham's brother, died, it was a custom of that day and time that the oldest son was to take care of the surviving family members. So Abraham is taking care of Lot and, and, and all, all of the surviving family members of his brother that had passed away. So what Abraham did, and part of the custom was there too, was to basically set, set them up not to fail. Financially speaking, we're, we're going to set you up. Now, now you're not going to be dependent on me for the rest of your life. Amen. This is like I'm giving you your inheritance up front, if you will. And, and if you squander it and you lose it all, you end up hopeless. Don't come back to me. That's your fault. Just for what that's worth. But that's how it worked back then. So anyway, so Abraham set him up because I'm going to set you up for a success. I'm going to set you up to fail. Set him up, taught him how to make money, taught him how to raise cattle, taught him to diversify. You know, don't, don't get all locked up in cattle and silver and gold. We're going to dig some wells. We're going to sell water, water and water rights. It's all in the Bible. It was one, many, many, many streams of income coming into Abraham's life. He was a progenitor of multiple streams of income. So had all this going on. And he taught Lot all this too. So over the years and years and years, now Lot is, you know, of course, now we're talking 10 plus years approximately now. Now Lot begins to build up. He becomes this very successful entrepreneur himself, all thanks to his uncle, Unc Abe, and, now, and, you know, other people begin to master him. He has all these employees and all these different businesses. Everything's going good. It's going, and it's so large, because, you know, they were staying together, but the companies were so large because primarily they were herdsmen. And ha so the land just couldn't sustain them both. So what happened is all of this, all of this schism and division from lots, people who were hanging with him, put this divisiveness in Lot's heart and it just began to fester. Now, we don't know how long, months, years, decade, don't know specifically, but this began to gnaw at Lot. You know, he started hearing things like, hey, hey, you're, you're, you're just as good as him. You don't have to answer to him. Man, you, you know, you, you, you've, you've, you've done just as good as he has. And, you know, you know, so all that stuff just starts building up. And then he starts thinking more highly of himself than he should. So Lot approaches Abraham, and he says there was a strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Now, now the, the, the problem wasn't in the heart of Abraham. The problem was in the heart, initially, in the herdsmen, we could say also employees of Lot, and they begin to persuade Lot to believe these very things against his own uncle. So all of this was occurring. Uh, so verse 7, there was stripe between the herd and the And the Canaan and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Then Abraham said unto Lot, because Abraham saw all this stuff going on, he wanted to head it off at the pass. Even though basically Lot had already separated from him. So Abraham, you can read, you have to read the whole story to, to discover that. Lot had actually separated from him. He had, he had pretty much shunned Abraham, put him out of his life. So Abraham goes to him, taking the high road. He could have gone to him and said, hey, I'm going to set you straight, boy. But he didn't. He said, you know what? You're, you're a grown adult. You made these decisions. You have these people whispering in your ears. Always remember, whoever, whoever has your ear will eventually have your heart. And you need to be careful who you have at speaking in your ear. Because I'm going to tell you something. Each and every day, if the people who are speaking in your ear are rooted and grounded in God's word, and they're speaking in your ear, I'm going to tell you something. You will eventually diminish your standing in Christ. You will eventually, eventually begin to erode the very foundation you have in Jesus Christ. Well, I'm just trying to win everyone. No, you're not. You know what's happening. You are allowing people to speak. I'm talking to somebody right now. I may be talking to everyone right now. You are allowing people to speak into your ear that you should not allow to speak into your ear. I'm going to say it again. Those who speak into your ear will eventually speak into your heart. Those who have your ear will eventually have your heart. You need to be careful who's speaking into your ear because eventually it's recorded all throughout the word of God. Study world history. Study this nation's history. It was many times it was people who were closest to the given leader 
or a given, a given person, a point person, if you will, that just continually was speaking into the ear that got to their heart eventually and they went a contrarian direction from be it God or be it the course of a nation, be it the course of people or whatever it is. You need to be careful. There's a reason why Jesus said, be careful what you hear. And you better make sure the source what you're hearing from is the right source. That is totally from the Holy Ghost. Somebody needs to hear that. So this is the beginning. This is the beginning of Lot going the wrong way. I mean, completely opposite. Do you realize because Lot was prone to give people his ear, which eventually got to his heart, he eventually ends up, tell me where he ended up. It's not a trick question, guys. It's in the Bible. He ends up in Sodom and Gomorrah. Why in the world did he end up there? With the background that he had and the foundation that he had with Abraham, who was the first one ever justified by faith? How in the world did he end up in Sodom and Gomorrah and he became governor, he became mayor of Sodom? What a title. Take that trophy home. How'd that help him? So, so the reason being is because Lot was, was always prone to the susceptibility of whoever. He gave everyone his ear. And his heart just went so many different directions. He ends up living in a cave, committing incest with both his daughters. Can't make this stuff up, guys. It's right here. We're not talking Game of Thrones. We're talking, this is Bible. It's in the Bible. So, Deacon Siegel, enjoy that line there. But anyway, so uh, let me get back to this. We, 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 we got to get to this faith thing here. We got to get to this faith thing. See, because there again, you give, you give certain people your ear, they're going to affect your heart, and then you're going to start seeing what they want you to see. You shouldn't be looking in that direction. You shouldn't even be looking in that direction because the direction you look at, you look at it long enough, eventually you're going to be there. You look in the direction of failure, you're going to, be, you're going to live there. You look in the direction of anger all the time, you're going to live there. Whatever direction you look at, eventually you're going to see that in your life. Look at this. I mean, let me prove my point. So Abraham goes a lot. So let there be no strife, I pray you. I, I plead with you. I don't want any strife between me and you, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. And then, then, then Abraham gives him the first choice. You choose. You choose wherever you want to go. And, and Lot says, you know, San Francisco looks like a real good area to me. So... Lot lifted up his eyes, verse 10, and, and beheld all the plain of Jordan. Real quick, that was not a good place. Now, it looked fertile. In the natural, it looked promising. In the natural, it was very enticing. In the natural, it was like, wow, this is my heaven on earth. In the natural, it looked like this is where I need to be. Not all that glitters is gold. Look at this. He lifts up his eyes. He looks at the the, the well-watered plain of Jordan. There again, he sees it's watered everywhere. This is wonderful. Now, this is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was at one time, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. And so Lot shows him all the plain of Jordan, which there again, there there, there were two. there, there, there There was a twin city there. You already know it. Sodom and Gomorrah. Men lived in Sodom. Women lived in Gomorrah. So Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. They separated themselves the one from the other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain. Now look at this. Abraham, which he's my kind of man in so many regards, spiritually even like this. Abraham's living out in the country. He's living this bucolic life. I mean, you know, he's, he, he, he is a pioneer. He's chopping down trees and building a log cabin. You know, he's just, he's just doing his thing. He just loves that, right? So he's living in the land of Canaan. Lot's living in the cities of the plain. Where are those cities? 
And you even notice he pitches his tent towards Sodom. Now, first, he's not living in there. He's living outside, but when he opens his front door every morning and goes out to get the newspaper, he sees, yeah, this is before it was online, he sees Sodom. So every time he walks out of out his front door and he's out there in his front yard enjoying his front yard, he sees Sodom. See, you... If you see something long enough, you're going to end up there. It's as simple as that. David saw Bathsheba to the point. You know the rest of that story. Didn't end up too good for David, did it? But bottom line is, so every day Lot is looking at Sodom. You keep looking at something long enough, even though that thing can destroy you, you keep looking at it long enough. First of all, you start getting spiritually anesthetized. You start getting spiritually anesthetized and, oh, yeah, you know, you linger a little bit more. You keep looking, keep looking, keep, whatever it may be. I'm not just talking about a sexual issue. I'm just across the board, whatever it is. You keep looking at that long enough and eventually you're going to live there because that's what you see in the natural. And eventually the natural, what you, here's how it works. In the flesh, what you see, you eventually will do and be. Now, in the spirit, what you see, you eventually become. So it's the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So when you see that, the lust of the eyes, then, of course, that, the lust of the flesh begins to creep in. Then, then it becomes a pride of life, which, of course, was the original fallen sin, right? Which will lead someone to sin. So in the natural, with what you see, it will eventually... It will eventually lead you to destruction. When you view things in the natural, it speaks to your flesh. It speaks to the, 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 the carnal cravings that we can all have. So if we're looking in the natural, we will succumb to it in the natural. And I'm not just talking about sexual issues, okay? I'm talking across the board. I'll elaborate here in just a minute. But when you begin to see in the spirit... It brings life to you, and you eventually become that. You eventually will dwell in that land, spiritually, eventually bringing forth eternal life into every area in your life. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at CICLive.com.